All right, so welcome to the second class period of Principles of Marketing. Kind of turn this a little bit. So last time we played Marketing Survivor, for those of you who were here and joined us. Is there anybody who was not here last time? Everybody was here. Okay. Well, that's good. We don't have to. We don't have to have a ritualistic human sacrifice up here. If somebody to try and figure out uh, whether or not they get to stay or go. So I told you that I would post a lot of stuff on YouTube, so I wanted to show you that. I handed out the syllabi last time. We went over that, right? Shake your heads, yes. We did do that. Tell me, tell me your assurance. You were here, you were alert from Chirpy, and you saw that. I wanted to show you on D2L where you can find that if you misplace it, if the windows will come up. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then I have your second critical thinking challenge for you. And I will give you the remainder of the hour to do that. And we're going to type it, and by the time we come back on Tuesday, what I should be able to do is I should have set up your groups in D2L so that you can submit it to the Dropbox. Nothing. Say you as a student. So this is what you see when you go to your D2L page. If you go to content, you'll see the syllabus there that you can print in case you lose it. A lot of times students will ask me, when is this or when the date is, and my response is generally going to be, it's in the syllabus. Those dates are in the syllabus, so you might want to look at those. I also posted the video from last time under Module 1, so there's the lecture from Tuesday. I try to get those up fairly quickly. It depends somewhat on the bandwidth and how many people are uploading things to YouTube at the time that I do it, but I try to get those up fairly quickly. I try to get them up enormously quickly when we do a test review. So the day before a test, I'll do a test review and I try to get those up. But you should also probably bring some kind of recording device that day if you want to record. You're always welcome to record me, but on that day in particular, you might want to bring something in case something happens to the technology and there's a failure so that you will have that information readily available for you. So just keep on uh, looking at D2L, make sure that you check your grades. I think I posted for everybody who participated. I posted your grades. I have those. I was going to turn them back, but I didn't get all of the groups set up in D2L. So what we'll do is for the group work, there will be drop boxes. If you go to the communication, there will be a drop box for things like that. And I post a lot of stuff on the news item for D2L. So you'll want to keep up with that. Look at D2L and make sure that you're uh, keeping up with what I post for news and things like that so that you'll know when videos have been posted or if there's any changes in schedule and, and uh, things like that that you need to be aware of. So let's start with talking about a little bit. I told you all last time that you were already, unlike every other class that you walked into, you're already experts in this class. If I gave you, for example, a rectilinear triangle, what's a rectilinear triangle? What's a rectilinear triangle? A really fancy triangle. A really fancy triangle? A right angle triangle. And I told you that one side is 3, the second side is 4. What should be the third side? 5. Five. From whence does this brilliant knowledge that those of you that gave me the answer come? Where did you get that? Where'd you get that answer from? Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem. And you learned that in geometry. Right? You learned that in geometry? I know, this is not supposed to be a math class. When you went into your geometry class, did you know anything about geometry? Maybe a little bit. You had some idea. But did you know what the definition of a plane was? Did you know what the definition of a rectilinear triangle was? Things like that. You didn't know a lot, but this class you already know 
a whole lot about because you participated in it every single day. Before you were even born, people were marketing to you, right? Medicine is marketed. We have neonatal care now, and that's a huge ordeal in making sure the baby, so people start marketing to you before you're even born. Before you were even born, maybe your mother had a baby shower. People bought stuff for you. And then the minute you were born, you started marketing. You cried. You let people know that you have wants and needs. So you already know a lot about this. Now, having said that, there have been radical changes even in the last five years. From the time I've taught here at the University of Central Oklahoma for 22 years now. 22 years. It's a long time. And there have been radical changes in marketing over that time period in terms of the way we inform consumers about our products. What's happened just in the last five years? Social media. Social media has taken off. That may be, you could even say, 10 years. What's even more recent than that? So you know, about 10 years ago, we got Facebook, and that became a big rage. And everybody was on Facebook, and now companies have figured out how to use Facebook to market. What else is a new trend in marketing? Cell phone it's apps. The cell phone apps, mobile marketing. It's not just social marketing now. We're now talking about mobile marketing. I use my telephone. Here you'll see me holding it a lot because I can control the camera with my phone. That's a relatively modern or contemporary invention. I can control the camera with my phone. And if the camera starts to, if it, if it eats up all of the memory that I have on an SD disk in there, you know what I can do? I can stream it directly to my phone and save it on my phone. And then what can I do with it? I can upload it to YouTube directly from my phone. Now, I generally don't do that because video takes up a whole lot of what? It takes up a whole lot of storage. So if I start to run out and I put it on my phone, all of a sudden I've eaten up all of the, the storage that I have on this phone. And I have the most amount of storage on this iPhone. So I tend to keep it on the SD disk. I take it over to my office computer. I create a, a thing and then I upload it to YouTube after class. That's really incredible. Those are huge technology changes in the way that we've been able to market. Part of this is me marketing to you. I really view, and my colleagues are horrified that I say things like this, but I really view myself as being a service provider. We'll talk about services in here. And so as the service provider, I try to do things that matter to you and give you good value for that, that tuition dollar that you are paying. And you are paying an ever-increasing percentage of that bill. When I went to college here in Oklahoma many, many, many years ago as an undergraduate, the state paid for about four-fifths of the bill. I paid about one-fifth of the bill. This is math. What percentage is that? 20%. 20%. I paid about 20% of the bill. What percentage of the bill do you now pay? Huh? It's about you pay you pay about eighty percent of the bill. It's flipped from uh, eighty percent being paid by the state to about eighty percent being paid by you. You're not paying the full bill, but you're paying a bigger and bigger percentage. In some states like Colorado, it's now up to ninety-five percent of the bill is being paid by students. So you should get good value for your money. Now, given that we've had these radical changes in technology and the way marketing is occurring, I'm now marketing to you by putting videos online. That was something that when I started teaching 22 years ago, this is my 23rd year actually, 23 years ago, I couldn't have dreamt of doing. The, Ability to put that up there in a cloud was non-existent. 
What else is, was non-existent 22 years ago? Well, huh? Instagram, Pinterest. What about just cell phones? There were actually cell phones. My mother had one. She was a realtor. And it was actually mounted in the car. And it ran off of a radio signal. And you basically had to be on top of a hill to be able to even use it. And then you patched into an operator who then put the call through basically used radio communication. Really old technology. And then the first cell phone that I got was actually a bag phone. 1991. It weighed, anybody remember the bag phones? It weighed seven pounds. It had a battery life of about four hours if you weren't talking on it. If you talked on it, the battery life was 10 minutes. <laughs> and then you had to charge it back up. And we really thought we were moving when I got the brick. There was these big gray brick things that they marketed. And then we got my first flip phone. And then now we've got these smartphones that do everything. I remember the first time I saw a camera on a phone, I thought that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Who the hell would want a camera on a phone? And the pictures were just gone. Now, we go on vacation and my mother's pulling out a camera. I'm like, what? why the hell do you have a camera? You got a phone? It's got a Carl Zeiss lens. Takes really good pictures, you know, and you can upload it instantly to the cloud and share with your friends. So given all of these technologies and all of these ways that we have changed, one of the things that we'll talk about in here is we, we no longer teach courses in marketing and advertising. We now teach a course called Integrated Marketing Communication because we recognize that that's just not the way we're selling things anymore. Ads are becoming less and less important. We're in the middle of a presidential election, and we've got one of the major candidates who's yet to really put out an ad. That's incredible. And he's still somewhat competitive, becoming less so every day, <laughs> but still somewhat competitive. I mean, he managed to win a primary by spending no money. Why? Because he engaged in integrated marketing communication. Advertising is not necessarily the way you're going to communicate with voters now. What did he do? He used totally brand new technology in terms of, uh, of campaigning. He's just tweeted. Tweets everything. And calls into shows and they let him on. Because he's got a big name and he draws ratings. And so we no longer teach advertising. We teach integrated marketing communication, recognizing that advertising is just a very small part of that P. We organize the discipline of marketing around four P's, product, price, place, and promotion. We'll talk about all of them. And we used to have, for the promotion part, a huge, big deal, and we would focus on advertising. Now we teach integrated marketing communication, recognizing that it's no longer just about getting your product on television. 20 years ago, 22 years ago, when I started teaching, we would have said if you could get on television, you could sell anything. Fine, you know, if you could get enough money, you could sell. Twinkies are a prime example. Who the hell would want to eat one? They sold millions of them until Hostess went broke, but somebody actually bought Twinkies. They're back. About three years ago, Twinkies were all off the market. People were going to the store buying Twinkies because they thought Hostess was never, they're never going to be made again. Anybody remember this? Yeah. The Twinkies were going to be gone. And by God, they're back. And they're just as God-awful as they ever were. <laughs> so my question to you today, this is an individual question, we'll see if we come up with answers. Given all of this that I have said, is an understanding of the history of marketing important? Or have we reached a point in time in which history is no longer important? Because we do things so differently. What do you all think? Anybody got an answer? History is always, we've got one person who's willing to give me an answer. Why is history always important? Because everything goes in cycles. Everything goes in cycles. Even the technology that we've never seen in the history of humanity, there 
are still something that we used similar to back in the time. Okay. I went to a lecture because I'm an academic and that's what nerds do is we go we go to lectures, you know, for fun. I actually traveled to Austin to hear a, a, a scholar by the name of H.W. Brands. Some of you may have seen H.W. Brands. If you watch the History Channel at all, he's on a lot of the history programs. The Men Who Built America, he's a scholar at the University of Texas at Austin, which is a very prestigious school, by the way. In fact, the University of Texas at Austin has the second largest endowment of any institution in the United States. The first largest endowment is held by Harvard. So a publicly funded institution called UT Austin has the second largest endowment. By the way, uh, UT Austin three times denied George W. Bush admission to its law school. Harvard, however, admitted them to their business school, proving that UT Austin has higher standards than Harvard in terms of their admission <laughs> criteria. So I went to listen to this lecture by H.W. Brands on Ulysses S. Grant and Rethinking Grant. And I was particularly interested in this because I was named for my father, who was named for an uncle, who was named for the general. So, in a roundabout way, I'm named after Ulysses S. Grant. One of the things that most people don't know about Ulysses S. Grant is that's actually not his name. What was Ulysses S. Grant's birth name? Anybody know? His birth name was even worse than Ulysses S. It was Hiram Ulysses Grant. And everybody called him Ulysses or Ulysses. And when his father wanted him to go to West Point, he got a congressman to write a letter of recommendation. The Army requires that you have a middle initial. And at the time, it was very common for people to take their mother's maiden name as the middle name of the child. So the congressman, not knowing that he was born higher than Ulysses, wrote a letter of recommendation for Ulysses Simpson Grant, U.S. Grant, and the name stuck. So H.W. Brands gives this lecture on rethinking Grant. Basically, most historians agree that Ulysses S. Grant was a brilliant general, won the Civil War, absolutely great guy in terms of that, but a miserable president. In terms of ranking presidents, historians always rank U.S. Grant at the very bottom of the list. He's down there with uh, Warren G. Harding, for example, who was completely a horrific president, and Richard Nixon. Everybody sort of recognizes that it's Nixon, Grant, and Harding that were the three worst presidents, according to most historians' rankings. And, and Franz rethinks this and says, well, maybe he wasn't as bad a president as everybody thinks. And he talks about all of Grant's accomplishments. But one of the things that he says that was in this lecture, he's lecturing, he says, one of the things that made Grant really, really successful was that he was absolutely calm in battle. Bullets could be whizzing by his head, and he would be absolutely 100% at ease. Something happened. There was nothing in Grant's past that suggested he would be a great person. He was a miserable student at West Point. He graduated in the bottom half of his class. He failed at business when he tried it. And yet, on the battlefield, he could maneuver troops and see things clearly. And so, Brands argues that Wars are really good ways of producing winners and losers. That's what a war does. There are winners and losers in war. And so I stood up when they asked for questions, and I said, Dr. Dr. Grant, do you really think that's true? Can we learn anything from Grant today, given the fact that I don't think we win wars? What was the last war we actually won. What was the last war we actually won? World War II. After World War II, we went into Korea. What happened in Korea? Well, we fought to a draw. And there are, to this day, two Koreas. A North and a South Korea. And it was a stalemate. After Korea, we went into what? Vietnam. 
Vietnam. Who won that war? Did the Vietnamese win that war? Huh? I don't know. I don't know if you could call it a draw. I think it was a, a major loss for both sides. If you looked at the number of people who were killed in Vietnam, did we kill more of them than they killed of us? No. We killed far more of them than they did of us. We carpet bombed. Did we win that war? Are we winning the war in Iraq? So I said, wars don't produce, if you're, if, you're, if you're looking at history and saying wars produce winners and losers, have we won the war in Afghanistan? Are, are we winning the war in Afghanistan? Can we win the war in Afghanistan? So given Brand's argument that history is a wonderful way of looking at things and looking and analyzing if we think about marketing as an analogy, the way we market is totally different. So is the history of marketing important? I don't know. You could argue that we had an end of history. There was a scholar that wrote that, a paper called The End of History. Now, he wrote it about the end of the Cold War, basically said history is going to be done. So do you think that understanding a history of marketing is important, <clears throat> given what I just said? can't even look at war, an age-old tradition, as being relevant in historical terms. Is there anything we can learn based on past well, Actually, there is maybe some stuff that we can learn. If you look at the British experience, when the American colonies decided to leave, why did they win that war? Superior force by the British, superior naval on the part of the British, far more money. Why did they, what can we learn from that historical lesson? I'll tell you what you can learn from that historical lesson. It's very difficult to conquer a people in their own land because they can outweigh you. So maybe we still can learn something from history. Maybe history still provides us with some guide. So I think history, I have a tendency because my first academic career. I was not a marketer. I started out as a political scientist and a historian. Got a bachelor's degree in political science and a bachelor's degree in public administration, a master's degree in political philosophy. Then went to law school and it wasn't until I got my PhD that I decided I wanted to be a marketer. So I, I have a tendency to think that history is somewhat important. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of marketing. Marketing as a practice is an ancient discipline. We don't know when the first societies formed, but we do know that once they did form, they began to market. They began to market themselves. It's necessary. Now, most of that marketing was in very rudimentary things, like what? Barter. I have eggs, you have a cow. You want eggs, I want what? Milk. So beef. I'm not sure that you're gonna get a lot of trade there, an egg for you know beef. But you know, these these we don't know where the first society actually went. We have ethos of this where we can find evidence. For example, we can find it among the ancient Hebrews, this idea of the formation of society. Where do we find it if we look in the uh, Hebrew Bible? Well, we find it in the story of Genesis. And which story of Genesis? Well, it's the eating of the tree of knowledge. And that's the point at which we are no longer tied to the cosmos. And we recognize ourselves as distinct and separate. And modern man is only associated with the period, with an epic or a historical time frame. But those first societies obviously engaged in marketing. As a discipline, though, we didn't begin to study marketing from an academic perspective until about the 20th century. And at that point in time, 
a number of scholars began to come together uh, and recognize that you could study marketing as its own sort of distinct academic pursuit aside from economics, which was what you had before. And so a lot of the early marketing studies actually come out of, uh, uh, of economics and departments of agricultural economics. The first marketing departments in terms of academics were founded at places like the University of Wisconsin. What do they have a lot of in Wisconsin? They produce a lot of cheese in Wisconsin. If you go to the State Fair, which is coming up, it's one of my favorite events. In the fall is the State Fair. I think you should all go to the State Fair. It's a wonderful marketing experience for you. They have this Wisconsin cheese curds booth. It's one of my favorite booths to visit, is the Wisconsin cheese curd booth at the State Fair. They're just, just excellent. So these early agricultural economics were worried about how you get goods from producer to consumer. So they started studying and they said, well, there's a production era. For most of history, we have had, so the history of marketing falls into about four distinct eras. The first is the production era. And this also corresponds with what we call a marketing philosophy, which is the production philosophy. And this era goes from the beginning of time, recorded history, until about the 1920s. Green is probably not the best color. So the idea behind this philosophy or this era is that if you produce something that's useful, people will buy it. <clears throat> this is better. Is this better? The black? If you produce something that's useful, this is about the 1920s, people will buy it. There's a movie some of you may have seen, rather old movie now, called A Field of Dreams. How many of you have seen this movie with Kevin Costner? It's really old. Why have you seen this movie? It's, old, it's ancient. It's from my era. Right? If you had to take away one line from that movie, what would it be? If you build it, they will come. That's the line. That can be the summation of the production era and the production philosophy. If you build it, they will come. That's the takeaway from the production era. If I make something, and it's at all useful, people will buy it. Yes? Is that recorded? Yeah, the beginning of recorded history. Which starts, I mean, you can think about this in terms of, you know, recorded history starts about, I don't know, 5,000 years before the Common Era. Somewhere in there. What is that commonly called? BC. Um, historians now use the designation, they used to say BC, we now say BCE, which stands for Before the Common Era. And we use the term common era to denote after, before the common era. That's sort of before the common era and common era. Common era represents what? In the old terms, they used to say BC and AD. And AD stood for Anno Domini and the year of our Lord. So the birth of Christ. 
get one anodomini. So if you build something, they will come. Now let's think about this. How many of you have a car? Anybody not have a car? You don't have a car. I'm blind, I don't drive. Okay. So, but you <laughs> drove here, somebody drove here. The bus. The bus, okay. Those of you who have a car, was it black? How many of you have a black car? You, ma'am, right there in the pink shirt. Why do you have a black car? <laughs> You don't know? You what? You liked the way it looked. You liked black. Oh, it does. Black cars are horrible in Oklahoma because we have this red mud. And when it's not red mud, when the breath of hell descends upon us in August and we get this dirt flying everywhere, black cars are just got off it because that red just shows up. I mean, like, you go down a country road in a black truck, and oh my God, it's just it's dirty. Before, and they're hot. The sun beats down in Oklahoma. In fact, by the way, we in many years here in Oklahoma, between Oklahoma City and Dallas, we have more days over a hundred than any other place in the country, except for Death Valley. The good Lord has blessed us this year. It has been blessedly cool. It's, it's August 25th and we're still not dying. I'm, I'm able to wear the suit without, you know, sweating to death, totally. So you have a black car. Who doesn't have a black car? Why don't you have a black car? Why not have a maroon car? Why not have a maroon car? You like maroon better? Who has a white car? Why do you have a white car? I specifically bought it for that reason. Because it's I white. I it to be cold. Huh? Like, I wanted it to reflect the sun. It reflects. It does. I, all of my cars are white. Yep. I always get white cars because, A, when the hot, hot sun in Oklahoma oxidizes them, you can't tell the difference. Yep. On the, when the clear coat goes away, it looks the same. <laughs> you know? and, and it's easy to clean, and it reflects all of this heat that you don't really want when you get in the car in Oklahoma. Go back in time to the first mass-produced automobile. What was the first mass-produced automobile? Ford Model T. The Ford Model T. And you could get a Ford Model T in any color you wanted so long as that color was black. black. <laughs> so long as that color was black, you could have it in any color you wanted. It had to be black. It had very few options. And people bought it. People, <coughs> old timers say they don't make them like that. Well, thank God. The Model T would run for about 8,000 miles before you had to replace every single part on it. Praise Jesus, they're not made that way anymore. How many of you have a car that's you've driven to 100,000 miles? That's nothing anymore. 100,000 miles, nothing. So, what happens is the production era gives way. It's no longer if we build it, you can come. Other people start to recognize that, hey, maybe people don't want a car that's just black. And so the Dodge brothers come along. They build a car. People start producing more and more cars, and we get differentiation. And then we get the sales era. The sales era of marketing. And it goes from about 1920, 1920 to about 1960. The focus is more and more firms enter the, the market. We're producing goods at a much greater rate. We have this industrial revolution, and we're able to now differentiate our products somewhat. We get more people like the Dodge Brothers, other people that enter the market. And so the focus now is no longer on just if you build it, they will come. It's on selling. Now, most of the bad ideas that we have about sales come from this era and from this philosophy. 
because this philosophy was based on what we call the ADA model, which stands for Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action, the A-I-D-A. -A. Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action. Make a pitch, make people aware, gain their interest, create a desire, sell. How many of you have been to Mathis Brothers? What was that experience like for you? Was it pleasant? Did you enjoy it? Anybody want to tell me how wonderful it was? <laughs> Why was it not pleasant? They, they were like vultures, waiting, salespeople. People love to buy, they hate to be sold. You love to buy, people hate to be sold. That was this model. We've got to make our pitch, get our, our desire, and get the sale, get the action. That's a good place to stop. We've got two more arrows to talk about. I want you to think about for your group, so I'm going to give you the rest of the hour because I have a meeting that I have to go to to do this. So for Tuesday, in your groups, your group project is to answer this question. Based on what I just started to tell you about the history of marketing, is marketing an art or a science? And I'll put this up on D2L. I will put it in the news item in the questions so that you can get them as well. There's another part of this question which is, is everything that we teach on a college campus either an art or a science, or is there something else? And then you need to justify your answers. And we'll talk about that when we come back. So I will put this up on D2L, but that's to get you started to think, and you're welcome to use the rest of this class time. To, uh, to do that, and I'll give you some time at the beginning of, of the hour next time to, uh, to work on this. And if you would put that into the site, a Word document, what I'll do is I'll set up groups, and then you can submit, have one of your members submit it to the Dropbox folder. One per group. One per group. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't want 75. One per group, and I'll set up groups, and then you can submit it to that Dropbox folder. All right? Yes, sir. So any questions about what you're supposed to do? Yes, ma'am. Submit it before Tuesday? Nope. It'll be due Tuesday at midnight. But we're presenting it on Tuesday? We'll talk about it on Tuesday. Is there a minimum or a limit to how long you will be? Nope. It's called critical thinking. Think critically. How long it should be to answer the question. I know it's horrible when I don't tell you exactly what you got to do. A lot of stress. I know. A lot of stress there. All right. So I will see you all on Tuesday.